So under your breath, what they call the old saints used to call it breath prayers. They were just like, say these soft prayers constantly. It was like pushing out a prayer. I'm going to ask you to say this just quietly. Lord, I believe for more. I believe for more. I believe for more for me, for us. I believe for more. More people coming into your kingdom. When the church goes, the church grows. I believe for more, Lord. Wouldn't it be amazing if all the friends you know who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus? Isn't that our prayer? Isn't that our heart's desire? Those family members that are so hard-hearted, wouldn't it be great if those people come to know Jesus? A a church that goes, you, you're the church, I'm the church. When we go and we dare to tell someone about the love of Jesus, their lives change. It's, It's an incredible thing. And you know what? We basically got nothing to do but just go. When the church gathers... The church grows. That's an incredible thing. You know, there's a promise in the Psalms that says um, how good and how pleasant it is for the family of God to dwell in unity. Because upon that, I will put my blessing. The very fact that you're here, some of you are sitting around tables, table, sitting next to each other, people, some people around you, you don't know. The very fact that you're here means God has been pushed by your presence to be present among us. Isn't that amazing? I also believe this. The church that gives is a church that grows. Something happens. I don't understand it. I don't have all the, you know, the stuff for that. But I just know that when people trust God and trust Him at His word, He does something amazing. Our God, I'm going to say an outrageous statement. Our God is irrationally generous. We have an irrationally generous father. He's not like the God of this world that impoverishes people's lives, that wrecks people, that deceives people, that traps people in prisons of chaos. He's this God of this world. He steals and he robs from us. And and here's the thing I know about the God of this world. The God of this world is mean-hearted and tight-fisted. If the God of this world had a body and you gave him a competition to swim the English Channel, and you said, before you go, you put aspirin, a disprin in his hand. He held it tight. By the time he got across, open his hand. That is, aspirin will be whole in his hand. The, the God of this world is so tight-fisted because this, the heart of this world is closed. And, and, and God is an irrationally generous father, not like the God of religion, not like the God of the religious church, controlling and law-binding, work-orientated, lifeless. God is an irrationally generous God. And, and, and this God is the God that Jesus knew. This is the God Jesus knows. And this is the God Jesus wants us to know. Uh, in his book, James Brown Smith, called The Good and Beautiful God, uh, he wrote this. The love of the Father, the redemption of Jesus, and the communion I have with Holy Spirit are not based on anything I do. It is a gift from Holy Spirit to believe in God who is good even when things are bleak. Isn't that incredible? It goes on, he says this, God's goodness is not something I get to decide on. Isn't that amazing? God's goodness is not what we get to decide on. God is good. We suppose that all the time. God is good. All the time. God is good. Okay, let's try again. I know the oaks are running. You don't have to use your energy on someone else running today, okay? God is good. And all the time, oh, come on, I love that. Generosity is the very nature of God the Father. Generosity. And His generosity is not what we decide on. Because God is good. And all the time, yes, there's nothing stingy about our big heavenly daddy. Nothing. He holds nothing back. And, there, and those of you 
who know Him as the good Father, who believe in Him, who follow Him. You would say like the psalmist would say, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Our God is a generous God, and we don't get to decide on that. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom is a message of the generosity of our Father in heaven. A generosity that breaks the power of impoverished hearts. The generosity that shapes our hearts like a potter shapes clay. A heart that contains his heart. A generosity that causes us to, causes us to live like Jesus lives, generously. Do you know there was that moment with Jesus? He was with his disciple and they were minding their own business and then they came upon all these people that were following him and they, they just keep, keep walking and he, he turned around and he felt like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with all these people? You know what Jesus said? He said, feed them. Don't let them just come and think that following me is like a, a religious experience. Let's show them the generosity of my dad. They said, what do you mean? There's so many people. And they said, well, go and, go and look for somebody. And they came and all we can find, all we can find out of 5,000, was it 5,000 people, something like that? All we can find is someone with a couple of fish and some pieces of bread. That's pretty disheartening. You know, Jesus said, I'll tell you what he did. I'll show you my generosity, the generosity of my father, because we don't get to decide on it. I'll tell you what you do. You break it and you give it to the next person. And so they started doing that. And the generous heart of God just started manifesting amongst them. And you know, at the end, they had so much left over, they had to put it in baskets. The generous heart of God wasn't going like, he's like, you know, like the Jewish uh, shopkeeper go, oh, no, not too much. Just hold it back. Not God, man. He just can't help himself. And when he does it, there's so much left over. You can go for seconds. You can go for thirds. I know that Russell would love that. There is no end to his generosity. He's so keen to display this heart to us. What would Jesus do? It's a great question to ask. What would Jesus do then to show the Father's generosity to the people near and around him? Did he do that only? No ways. There were lots of those moments, tons of those moments. Do you remember that person who couldn't walk and he just laid hands on them? Next minute they were running, blind, and all of a sudden they could see. The generous heart of God just being displayed amongst what, what would you, when you're in the supermarket and you you're buying your you know your organic triple squeezed purple tree juice whatever and you're in that zone why don't we ask this question what would Jesus do if he was here and these people were here what would Jesus do? I'll tell you what Jesus would do. He'd come up to us and say, hey, do you only want that? And we'd go awkwardly, go, oh, I th um, yeah, I'm only looking for this. You know, I'm on a tight budget. He'd go, I'll tell you what you must do. Why don't you just take one of everything? Yeah, but I don't know. Just take one of everything. In fact, come with me. I'll get the basket. I'll fill it for you. One, in fact, two, three, four. Hey? And then you go, this aisle's not big enough, man. Come, I'm going to get a trolley. Then you can choose anything you want. I think that's what Jesus would do. Have you ever been around people who would do that? You're standing in the queue. You're going to pay for something. You get to the till, and it's paid. Have you ever been in a restaurant? You're eating a meal. You get the bill, and it's paid. Have you ever been there? Hey? Wouldn't you like to be in the restaurant? You're sitting there, you're loving your meal, and you ask this question, Jesus, what would you do? What do you think he would do? He'd go, to everyone in the restaurant, I just want you to know, Quentin's paying. <laughs> no. 
I, I, I think somewhere along the line, because of our lives and the hardship and the complexity of finances in our lives and because of our background and because we stand backish and we feel so awkward to receive, I'm one of those guys, I find it so hard to receive. And God's going, I'm going to give to you so much until you can receive, until you can take it with joy and celebrate what I give you. And I kid you not, that's what God is doing. He is spoiling me like you cannot imagine. He is doing things in my life I never thought possible. And I go, ah, oh, I can't do this, Lord, please. This is so awkward. And he just keeps pouring out his generosity. Why? Because his generosity is not decided by me. His generosity on, uh, in the world that we live in is not decided. I was in a restaurant this week with a friend of mine in, in Pretoria. And we're eating the meal. And he's eating the meal and he's looking around the room all the time. He's eating the meal. He says to the waiter, I need my check, please. And he's looking around. And then the bill comes and he's about to pay. And the guy says, uh, no, don't worry, it's been paid. And he gets up and he starts looking around. Who was that? You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to do that and he wanted to pay for someone else. And I'm going, I'm in a restaurant with these guys, and this is like, just like generosity overflowing. They could not help themselves, like a game. And then, and then, who loves it the most? The waiters. They love it the most. Because it's like, you're going to see the generosity of God amongst these people, and then all of a sudden, whatever the bill comes to, they get the tip the same amount. And it's like, What? The heck is going on here? You see, we don't get decide, to decide on the generosity of God. And we've allowed the devil to deceive us and rob us from who our, our good, good father is. If you have your Bibles, my text this morning is 1 John. John 1. John 1. Not 1 John. John chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 10. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And he came into the very world he created. But the world did not recognize him. And he came on his, to his own people. And even they rejected him. To all who believed in him. Listen to To all who believed in him and accepted him. He gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus came. The word became flesh. Jesus came. And he came to his people. And his people rejected him. And then the scripture says this, but to all who believed in him, to all, and all who accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They were reborn, not with a physical rebirth birth resulting from human passion and plan, but a birth that comes from God. And then it says in verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Grace came down. Grace came down. I'm driving to the airport on Friday morning and I see this humongous sign. It's most probably uh, as big as that. Massive thing. And it had three words. Grace came down. Wow. I just, I, I, I thought I nearly pulled the driver off the road. Look at what, look what Jesus is saying to me. Grace came down and we saw his glory, a glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Our irrationally generous God is nothing like the religious God of the church. Nothing like. He is irrationally generous. He gave his all to each one of us. Nothing about our good, good father makes sense. Nothing makes sense at all. Nothing makes sense that he would send his one and only son to die for a world that would remain enemies with him. And pursue a sinful life. And want to remain stubborn hearted. And he gave his very all. His one and only. His son, Jesus Christ. Nothing about that generosity makes sense. Nothing. He gave us his all. He held nothing back. Grace came down. Grace. His grace finds us. Regardless of how far away we are from Him, His grace finds us. His grace saves us. 
no matter how unworthy you feel, how unworthy we feel, regardless of who we are and what we've done, His grace alone saves us. I heard someone say this, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. John the Baptist is just about to baptize Jesus. You find this in 1 John 19, uh, 29. And, uh, and he says these words. He says, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold, grace came down. Can you see who I see? Can you see who's among us? Can you see God gave us all? Behold, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And then we hear John's words just a little bit earlier saying, but to those who accept him and to those who receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, the moment we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the moment we accept him as Lord and Savior is the very moment two divine acts take place in our hearts. One we become born again of the Spirit. God puts His Spirit, His presence in our chests. And we breathe, res and He breathes resurrection life into our beings, into our existence. Once we were dead, but the Lamb of God makes us alive through Christ. And you know, in that very moment, Lorraine, everything is new. Everything is new. Paul says, anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things are passed away and, and everything is made new. Everything, all things are passing. Everything is made new. You know what my problem was when I became a Jesus follower? I kept the old things. I didn't believe that Jesus could change me completely. And as I started trusting, I started realizing that's what he's done for me. I'm new. I don't understand it. I don't fully get it. I don't understand grace. I'll be the first one to confess. I do not understand grace, but I'm so glad grace found me. I'm so glad grace saved me, Jesus Christ. You know, the second thing that happens, the moment Christ enters our lives, we discover who we are. We discover who we are. We discover our true identity. You know what that is? We sing it. I am a child of God. I am his son and I'm his daughter. That's who we are. It's hard, eh? It's hard to, hard to think that. It's like, no, but I'm, I'm coming to church because I want to be a, a good church member. I'm coming to church so I can be a, a mighty man or mighty woman of God. And God's going, I know what you want to do, but let me tell you who you are. You're mine. You know, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the heavens opened. The windows of heaven opened and the presence of God was there. And God spoke and he said this to his lamb, this is my son, who I love so much. This is my son, who I bless with everything I have. And when you get saved, the Father opens the windows of heavens. He looks over our lives and he says, to everyone in the world, in the creation, he says, this is my kid, who I love so deeply. That's what happens. We become his family. But you need to hear the full story of this. If, we, if we're his, you know, Matt's my son's quite obvious. You can see it, eh? He's as tall as me, as handsome as me. And you can see, not close. Imagine if he was like me, hey? 
You know, when I was born, I was so ugly, the doctor slapped at my mother. And you can see that Caleb belongs to Matt, and that somewhere it's connected to me. What is that? You know, when, when you are born, you're born with family genes. It's in your DNA. Ah, our daddy, our heavenly daddy is an irrationally generous daddy. Our God is genes. You got his genes. If you follow Jesus, you've got his genes. You're not just saved to be a Christian, to live a good life. You're saved to live as a son and daughter of God, to be his family, to know who you are. You know who you are. You got his genes, his makeup. So when you, when you go shopping, you can walk down an aisle and you can say, hey man, when you get to the till, you don't have to tell them that. But when you get to the till, you can actually, if you want to, if you really believe that your daddy is an irrationally generous God, you can go, well, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to display you. I'm going to show the world who you are. You pay for, their, pay for their groceries. It's crazy, eh? Hey? It's happened to me. It's incredible. It happened to me. I'm driving to the, check my new shoes. You know, um, I'm driving to the airport with this friend of mine. And he says to me, Britt, we're going to be late. We've quickly got to go to Menlo. Big thing in Pretoria. Massive thing. Park thing imaging. More. And we, it's Johannesburg, Pretoria, Johannesburg. Traffic we're driving says, Brett, on the way, I need, a, I need a stop off. I, I feel the Lord wants me to buy you a pair of shoes. I just burst out crying. What do you mean you want to buy me shoes? No, Brett, I, I want to buy you some shoes. Are you kidding me? So we get there. We've got to get there early because we can only spend 15 minutes there because then we've got to get back into the traffic at the airport. Can I tell the story? Is that all right? I'm telling it. It doesn't matter. My dad spoils me, man. So we get there, guess what? All the other shops are open except that one. Uh, what's it called? FOM? Say it again. Freedom of Movement. That's the business called Freedom of Movement. It's a local company owned by a guy called Berger down in Stellenbosch. Young guy, 35. And um, he said, I want to buy you a pair of shoes because there's something I want you to read on them when you, when you look at the soles. Because I believe that when I, was watch, when I was part of the seminar that you were doing, I, felt, look, I looked at your shoes, which you wore every night. <laughs> I thought, oh, shame, man. And um, <laughs> thanks for noticing. <laughs> felt so awkward. Eh? And <laughs> I quite fancy my tackies, man. And uh, he says, underneath them, Brett, are two words on each shoe. Stay free, keep moving. And it just hit me, eh? It just hit me like a, a lightning bolt, like, bah. My God, he sees me. Our irrationally generous God sees us. Our Father, he doesn't close his eyes to our lives. He sees us. And so uh, here I am in my new shoes with big fat blisters, I must tell you. They look like it, but they're killing me. Here we are in an auditorium. And, and if we're honest, we don't deserve the grace of God. If we're honest, we do not deserve the irrational generosity of God's heart on our lives. And if we're honest enough, we do know, if you've been here long enough, you realize we cannot earn God's grace. We can do what we like. There are a lot of Christians trying to earn their, their points with God. And God's going, nah, that's not the way this is. I have done all that work. And I put that work on my son. That's why it says, come to me, all you are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And, and we're somewhere along the line. You know, we South Africans, hey, somewhere along the line, the, the religious spirit has hooked onto us and won't let go. And I've seen it in every culture. It doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter what background you come from, what family you come from. I see this religious thing and it hooks on. And there's only one who can take that hook out of you. And his name is Grace, Jesus Christ. He sets us free. 
so we can keep on moving, so we can live in the place that God wants us to live. We don't deserve it. We do not earn it. But he still gives himself to us. We sang, it was the first song I think we sang this morning. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, the overwhelming, irrational, generous nature of God. Once I was blind and now I see. I was lost and now I'm found. That's grace. That's God. That's our God. In verse 16 it says, For of His fullness we have all received, for of His fullness. Did you hear that? Of what? Of His nature. Of His generous nature. We have all received. Yeah, but, but I don't see it. Ah, I hope your eyes are open today. Of His fullness we have all received. And it's not up to us. We have received it. We must receive it. Some of you are going, I'm not too sure I see evidence of that in my life. Maybe it's because you do not know how to receive. Well, I struggle to receive. I struggle for many years. And Leanne is saying, well, Brett, you need to learn to receive. So, but look, I don't want to be like one of those pastors always asking, well, I never do that, but I don't want to feel like I'm. And he said, Brett, will you just shut up? Receive. You see, when you give, Think of God giving with irrational generosity. He gives because his heart is opened. It's sometimes easier to give than receive. Am I right? Some, for some of you, it's easier to receive than give. But regardless, if we're going to give, we give because our hearts are open to give. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what it is, and I'll talk about that. But when we receive... You can't receive like that. You've got to receive with open hearts. Open heart, open hand. It works both ways. I love the New Living Translation. From His abundance, we have all received grace upon grace, blessing after blessing. Our irrationally generous Heavenly Father has given us his all. And we are, true story, we are undeserving recipients of his grace. We are undeserving. I, I do not deserve his grace. But that's not up to me. I don't decide on that. He has. It's been such a shift for me. I don't, I don't decide that. I don't decide how God b behaves to me. That's the way he chooses. I need to decide, am I going to be a recipient of his all, his abundance? He is a generous, by nature, he is a generous father, and there's nothing stingy about our dad. He holds, he holds nothing back. And, and, and seemingly there's nothing to gain from him. And what, what, is he, what has he gained? I'll tell you what Jesus has gained. Has gained. Uh, what the father has gained from his generosity. He has, he has gained a family. But he's also gained rejection and enemies and hate and unbelief and heart. He's gained it, but it didn't stop him. Don't you love that, that word in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only mind-blowing. God gave an irrationally, God as, as an irrationally generous father gave his son his all. So let me, I'll close and I'll carry on another time. Irrational generosity is in your genes. And you have decided on it too long. It's not your choice. If you're his, it's not your choice. Irrational generosity comes from love. Comes from love, not for love. Did you get that? 
It's because we are loved. We can be irrationally generous, not because we want to be loved. It's, we irrationally, it's in our genes. We can be irrationally generous because we blessed. And because we blessed, we bless. Did you get that? Such a subtle shift of words. I'm blessed, therefore I bless. I'm not irrationally generous because I want to be blessed. That's incorrect understanding of God. That's an incorrect interpretation of giving in whatever arena. We never give to get. It's not for our gain. Our irrational generosity is for God's glory. You know, I burst out crying, and I've just been so overwhelmed this week by people. Pair of shoes, for goodness sake. Work it out. A meal. Forgiveness. A hug. None of us deserve that. And there are thousands of people right around us, deprived, impoverished, just waiting for God to break in. And then he reminds us this morning, you got my jeans. So we need to be Jesus in jeans. Irrational generosity is not for our gain. It's for God's glory. It's for the good of those around us. You know why? Because it's all about amazing grace. The thought of irrational generosity in our culture is so counterculture. We live in a world where we give as little as we can. That's the world we live in. True story. We, live, we give as little as we can. And we ask you so because we can't afford to give. What's mine is mine. We live in a world where we give when we can. I need more time to give. I need more money to give. I, need, uh, I, I give the things that will give me strokes. So I'm going to give when I can. That's the world we live in. And we live in a world where we, we give to gain what we can. What's in it for me? I'll only give if I get back. The heresy of the prosperity gospel is that we think we can get blessings from God if we give God money. What a joke. And he's going all the time, I've given you my all, and I'll give you more. You don't have to pay a cent. Another thing. I'll give to gain what I can. I'll only give if I get back plus interest. What's in it for me? We live in a world that says, this is sad. This is sad. We live in a world that says, the church just wants our money. Or the church is stingy. Why aren't the church the first people at the front? That's why I don't go to church. Have you heard that before? You know what breaks that? The irrational generosity of God someone said this a selfish heart is triggered whenever we believe giving will somehow diminish what we have so next week I'll, I'm going to carry on I'm going to talk about this so that it could get into our souls you know we've been talking about vision as a church and if, there's, if there is anything that we could get this is it Anything. If we want to go, we go because we know we've got a generous dad. If we're going to gather, we know because we're going to, we're going to share generous, generous lives together. We know that. We're not after anything. We just want to be that. We want to, I want to just see all of us with this like little naughty smile on my, our faces. Because why? Because you know you're blessed and you can't contain it. You just want to share the love of Jesus. But we don't have enough money. That's not the issue. It's never the issue. But if you got a little bit and you give it away, like that widow who gave away her might, it exploded the heart of Jesus. He just said, I see my dad. All the millionaires dropping in all their bags of coin never saw that. He didn't see, they didn't hear the sound of grace. And there that woman put, cling, cling. 
her all. The sound of grace. God is good. And all the time. Amen. God is irrationally generous. All the time. All the time. God is irrationally generous. Won't you stand, please? I would like to pray for you.